So let's consider the same problem that we did in the last lecture, which is just water draining out of a container. So I'm going to have again my container with height h, area a, volume h times a, and volumetric flow rate q. Now in the last video what we saw is experimentally for a given tube we saw a linear relationship between the flow rate of water coming out of the tube to the height of the water in the tank. Uh, now let's consider a slightly different experiment where what I'm going to do is simply monitor the height in our container as a function of time. We know the volumetric flow rate coming out of the tube that the rate of change of the volume contained inside the container is going to equal to minus Q. So the, the, the rate that this volume decreases is the rate that the water is flowing out of the tube. So now if we go to time equals to zero, we have our initial height here. And so we come over to this graph, and for that height, we know this Q. And so that'll tell me the rate that water is leaving the container, and therefore the rate that the, that the level of the water is changing. So I calculate that, and I let the water drain for a little while. However, I don't continue along that, that slope, right? Because as the height decreases, the volumetric flow rate of water leaving the container also decreases. So now my slope decreases a little bit more. And again, it drains for a little while. And I look again, and up, the slope has changed even more. And so rather than dropping linearly, we'd expect maybe that the height of the water would do something along the lines of a curve that looks something like that. So now let's check the experiment and see if that's actually true. So here I have my graduated cylinder full of uh, water with green food coloring. I've got a tube attached to it. I've got a little clip on it right now so the water doesn't run out. So let me release the clip and let's watch what happens. So the clip is released and you'll notice that the level of the water starts falling. This is like watching paint dry, right? Pretty exciting. Doo -doo -doo. Oh my goodness, this is so boring, right? But you can definitely see it really slowing down now. My goodness, it's so boring, right? What do you think? Let's call it five minutes. So here's my experimental data for height versus time for the experiment I just showed you. So I just took a stopwatch and I wrote down the height at different times uh, by looking at the tick marks on the graduated cylinder as the height went down. And so as we explained at the beginning, the height does not drop uh, at a constant rate, but you can see that the rate uh, slows down. And you can see that by eye definitely in the video. So now let's see if we can explain this data uh, quantitatively. So we can write an equation that the time rate of change of the volume in the tank is equal to the negative of the volumetric flow rate out. And the units work out because we measure the flow rate in milliliters per second. We measure volume in milliliters. And the time rate of change of volume would be milliliters per second. So the volume changes, volume of water in the tank just drops because there is flow out of the tank. Now, we know that the volume is equal to the area of the tank times the height. So I can simply replace that, area times the height. And we know from, from our data of just a single tube that the pressure applied to the tube is proportional to the flow out through the resistance. So we had an expression that the pressure applied equals Q times R. And if you remember, the pressure applied in our tank was nothing more than the density of fluid, gravity, times H. So let's make those substitutions. So I'm going to substitute in that Q is equal to minus delta P over R, and that's minus rho G H over R. Now we have a bunch of constants in here that we can sort of move around. Since the area is constant, I can move it inside or out of the derivative. And I can finally rewrite this expression as that the time rate of change of the height is equal to rho G R over A with a negative sign times h. And now we can also rewrite this as minus h over tau, where we'll say that tau is equal to r a over rho g. Let me slide that up a little bit. And this is convenient because tau, if we just simply look at the units of our equation, has to have units of time. We can see that whatever this parameter is, we'll discuss uh, extensively in a minute, but that the time increases as the resistance goes up and the cross-section of the area of the tank goes up. So we have a big tank, it's going to take a long time to drain. If we have a high resistance, it's going to take a long time to drain. So we have this simple expression that tells us the time rate of change of the height is proportional to the negative of the height itself. Okay, now let's solve this equation. The time rate of change of the height is proportional to the height divided by this time scale tau, which is our parameter. 
So the way we solve this, you may have seen this trick before, but we move the H's on one side and the T stuff on one side. And then we, when we integrate, we can actually integrate this expression now because dH over H, you may recall, is the natural logarithm of H. And we can easily integrate a constant dt divided by tau is just minus t over tau. And then we have some constant of integration, we'll call it c1. Now I, can, I want to get an expression for h, not the log of h, so I could rearrange this expression by taking the exponential of both sides. So I have h is e to the minus t divided by tau plus c1, which I could write as e to the c1 e to the minus t over tau. Now c1 is an arbitrary constant, so e to the c1 is also an arbitrary constant. So I can write this as some arbitrary constant, just c now, minus t over tau. And then the way we find what this arbitrary constant is, is by applying an initial condition. So at time is equal to zero, that's presumably known. We know the initial height of, our, of the water in our container. So that's equal to c times e to the zero. And e to the zero is just one. So our constant out front is nothing more than the initial height of the container. So h as a function of time is equal to the initial height times e to the minus t divided by tau. So now if we take our experimental data, we can compare this function to what we measured. And remember, tau is just a parameter. Tau is something that we know. Tau is equal to the resistance of the tube times the area of the tank divided by the density of the fluid times g. Now we know all these properties because we can measure all of these. We know g, we know the density of water, we know the area of the container. Now tau is just a parameter, so we know the resistance of the tube because that's something we measured already. We know the cross-sectional area of the container, we know the density of water, and we know g. So this is a number that we can come up with, and if we calculate that number for our experiment, and then we overlay this function with our experimental data, you see we get a quite excellent fit. So our simple model uh, has it really captures the trend of our data quite well, uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Now, another thing, it's the interesting way to look at the data is if we go back to this, we see that the log of h is linear in time, and so we can actually another way that people like to sometimes look at the data is to plot it as such, where we plot the height in logarithmic coordinates and the time in linear coordinates. And now you see both our data and our model show a straight line. And again, this straight line for our model, there are no fit parameters. Those are just uh, numbers that we know or we can measure. So we have quite excellent agreement. So here we are in semi-log coordinates, and here we are in linear coordinates. So our solution to this equation uh, was that the height as a function of time is the initial height times e to the minus t divided by tau. So let's just sort of look at this function here for now and sort of think about a little bit what that looks like. So here I've plotted the function. I've set tau is equal to one. So I'm just plotting the function e to the minus t. So we notice a few things about this, and this might be a function you're familiar with. So one is that it decays very quickly. So by f when we get out to a time is equal to five, so we have e to the minus five, we've decayed quite closely to zero. Another interesting thing about this is we can uh, figure out what the constant tau is, right? In this case, it's just one, so it's t divided by one. It has an interesting interpretation. So if I take a straight edge here, so I'll just use this index card, and if I line it up perfectly with the slope here at the beginning, and we just draw a line like that, you see that at least into the, with the error of my uh, index card here, the intercept, when we take the slope here, we extrapolate down to, uh, to this axis, we cross at tau at time is equal to one. So uh, that's just kind of an interesting interpretation of what the constant is here, tau. Now, if we compare by changing the value of tau, so here we have e to the minus t divided by one, so tau is equal to one, here we have e to the minus t divided by two, so tau is equal to two. And again, I can do my trick. I can get my little index card here as my straight edge. And again, tau is equal to two, so it lines up right exactly with that axis, and we've already seen the tau is equal to one. And you see now it takes a little bit longer for it to decay. So here we have tau is equal to four, compared to tau is equal to two, compared to tau is equal to one. And again, I think you'll believe me if I do my trick of extrapolating my slope here. I can hit the x-axis here at, at four. 
But let's do another thing. Let's look at the value here. At tau is equal to two, at tau is equal to one. We'll notice that all of those have the same value at that time. So our interpretation of this constant tau is that it just sort of stretches things out in time. So when tau is long, it takes a long time for things to decay. When tau is short, it would take a shorter time for decay, things to decay. And now you can imagine that if we overlay tau is equal to a half, that we would have a curve that would come in something along the lines. I'm just sort of sketching it, so it might not be exactly like that, but that would be approximately tau is equal to one half. Okay, so again, that was a hydraulic analogy. What does this have to do with circuits? So let's introduce a component called a capacitor. Um, I have a few right here. This is kind of what they look like. They come in different packages and colors, but uh, there are two examples. Uh, they basically look the same, probably. One is a different color. This is a ceramic capacitor. This is a little film capacitor. And um, the capacitor is going to act in a way kind of like the tank in our experiment. So for now, we're going to take this as an empirical law. But and you, you might be familiar with this. You may have seen this before. But one of the laws you'll often see for a capacitor is written like this, where Q is not the flow rate of water, but the charge. C is the capacitance, and V is the voltage. On a circuit diagram, a capacitor will have a symbol that looks like this. So it's like a break in the wire with two parallel plates. And the reason it has that symbol is because that's essentially physically what it is. And so the empirical law for the capacitor is that the voltage across the capacitor, so here, V would really be the delta V, the voltage across it, but you often see it written this way. So the empirical law is that the total charge stored in the capacitor is proportional to the voltage across it. Now I say empirical law because we can measure that uh, and we'll often do this in class and we'll sort of observe this to be true. Now later when you take electromagnetism you'll sort of prove or you can derive kind of where this law comes from, but for now we'll just take it as empirical law. The form, though, that we'll use this law in is we'll take the time derivative of it. So we'll, we'll talk not about the charge, but the time rate of ch charge. So dQ dt, the time rate of charge, is what we know to be the current. So the current going through the capacitor is equal to the capacitance times dV dt. Now, where does this number come from, the capacitance? Well, it's de determined by how big these plates are, how close they are. Now there's no way you can read this in the in the video, but printed on the capacitor is a number. So they're simply manufactured to have certain values, and they're they're usually pretty small. So the units of capacitance is the farad. So that's the unit, and we'll often see that capacitors have pretty small values. So the the range of things that we'll use is maybe we'll use things down to uh, you know 0.1 nanofarads or 0.1 times 10 to the minus 9 farad. So that might be a typical low value we use. And we can actually go lower than that. And a typical high value we might use is 10 microfarads. Or that would be 10 times 10 to the minus 6 farad. So we'll use kind of a, a fairly large range, a few orders of magnitude. We can obviously go higher than this. We can go lower than this. Um, but that's just sort of maybe a typical range of sort of common values that we'll, use in, that we'll use in class. And so again, the law that we'll use is that the current is proportional to the time rate of change of the voltage. And now just to be a little bit more precise, when we talk about the voltage, we mean the voltage across the capacitor. So to be sort of consistent, even though this is how you'll often see it written, we'll write it like this, the time rate of change of delta V, so meaning the voltage again across the capacitor. Okay, so now let's construct a simple circuit using capacitors. So I'm going to take a resistor and a capacitor and I'm going to put them in series and I'm going to connect them to ground. And so we'll discuss ground maybe a little bit later, but for now just consider this is the point where I'm always holding the voltage here to equal to zero. Here I'm going to have a voltage V and at time is equal to zero that voltage is going to be equal to one. And also, I'm going to hold this voltage here at 1. So if we remember our laws, for the resistor, we have delta V across the resistor is equal to IR. For the capacitor, we have the current is equal to C time derivative of delta V. And here, this is delta V across the capacitor. Here, this is delta V across the resistor. At T equals to 0, delta V across the resistor is 1 minus 1, so it's 0 equals IR, so therefore 
the current is equal to zero. If the current's equal to zero, our capacitor law is that zero is equal to C d by t t of delta v across the capacitor. So that means this is not changing, and so it's consistent to have one volt here, one volt here, and zero volts here initially. But now what we're gonna do is, at, is just after our time is equal to zero, I'm gonna plunge this point into ground. And so now this point is not set at one volt, but is set at zero volts. So now let's look at our laws again. At time greater than zero now, we have delta V across the resistor, which is zero minus, I'm gonna call this voltage here V because now it's changing with time. So it's V of T, so it can change with time, is equal to IR. And since I took my voltage drop to go from this direction to this direction, I need to draw my current arrow flowing that way, even though it might turn out that our current here is actually flowing the other direction. But it's no matter because the sign will take care of things. So I'm gonna just draw the current going that way. Now through our capacitor, that same current must be flowing. So we just write our capacitor law is I is equal to C d by dt of V of t minus zero. So now you can see it's convenient that we have the, the, the zero here and the zero here. So I can combine these two laws because again, Kirchhoff's current law tells us the current flowing through resistor must flow through the capacitor. So this current here is the same thing as that current here. So if I simply substitute that in, I have the current minus V over R is equal to C dV dt, or I can rearrange this expression so we can write it as dV dt is minus V over RC. We can substitute in that RC is equal to tau, where it's, we're just defining tau to equal to RC. So it's interesting here that resistance in ohms times capacitance in farads gives us a time constant in and it has units of time. So ohms times farads equals seconds, which is kind of interesting. And now if you notice, this equation here is exactly what we had before. So let's just summarize a little bit. So in the hydraulic case, the time rate of change of the height of the level of the water is equal to dh dt is equal to minus h over tau, where tau is given by the resistance of the tube times the cross-sectional area of the tank. So if the tube is long and skinny and has a higher resistance and the tank is very, very large, it takes a long time to drain and so our time constant is very long. In the circuit world, we have the exact same equation, but now we're talking about the time rate of change of the voltage. Our time constant, again, is very similar. It's R times C, so the resistance of the resistor and the capacitance of the capacitor. So if the resistance is high, which in our analogy, the tube is the resistor. So just as here, if the tube is long and skinny, here if the resistance is high, our time constant is long. And if our capacitance is large, our time constant is also large. So just like in the tank, if the capacity of the tank is very large, uh, then our time constant is very long. So we have the exact same dynamics in our hydraulic system, which you might be uh, very familiar with, and our electrical system, which you might be less familiar with. And the final thing is these have the exact same solutions. So if I created a plot, and if I remove the units by plotting the initial voltage divided by the voltage at time is equal to zero, or the initial height divided by the height at time equals to zero, and on this axis I plot T divided by tau, all the solutions would look the same. They'd look like E to the minus T. Again, the solution of this one would simply be that the voltage is the voltage at time equals zero, e to the minus t over tau. So we have the exact same solution, the exact same behavior, and if we plot them as ratios, so voltage divided by initial voltage or height divided by initial height as a function of t over tau, so both of these have no units, so it's a dimensionless plot, both systems would have a, a solution which looks identical, which is an exponential decay. So in our future videos on circuits, we will, this uh, particular circuit here with a simple resistor and a capacitor will actually be quite useful. But for now, we'll just consider it as a simple little theoretical thing. So this is a circuit um, that we'll find has a number of applications. Um, and this is also a circuit where we'll measure this behavior and you'll see this behavior for yourself in lab.